And I think we are set now to get us started. So let me open this up with a short prayer. Lord in heaven, we come before you and we ask that you would minister to us even as we continue to digest your word as far as sexual purity is concerned. Thank you for your servant, Ernest. I pray that you would use him through this forum. Oh God Almighty, as we have heard him speak to us in such a profound way early on, I am praying that God, even as we dissect and digest, and even ask some more uh, specific questions, would you be present with us? And would you bless us? In Jesus' name we pray, and God's people say it, amen. Amen. So, Ernest, you... I want to invite you and let you uh, to actually uh, take a few minutes and just uh, again introduce yourself and just uh, bring a quick greeting as we get started with this session. Karibu Ernest. Thank you. Asante sana, Pastor Kihu. Can you hear me clearly? Yes, we can hear you loud and clear. Great. Nice to see all of you. I uh, hope you're having a great evening. My name is Ernest Wamboye. I am a follower of Jesus Christ, I'm born again. I met Christ in high school and he transformed my life. I'm really glad to be here. I'm married. My wife and I have been married for the past nine years and we have two children. My wife's name is Waturi and we've got two children. Their names are Tandi and Ivana. Tandi is five, Ivana is three. And we are really, really excited to uh, have the opportunity to share the gospel today uh, through me specifically. Um, what do I do? I am the founder of the Relationship Center, which is a family-oriented ministry that does a number of things. One of the things that I do is that we run a pornography addiction recovery program for men. We help men who are battling pornography addictions. We help them set free. We help them discover their masculinity. We help them get their identity right. We help them restore their relationship with God and have healthy relationships with women. And we also run a podcast called the Relationship Center Podcast. And we have it available wherever podcasts are found. And apart from that, we also uh, run a premarital class that is for people who are contemplating marriage in the near future. And together with a host of many other things uh, that are just geared towards helping people espouse biblical family values. Apart from that, I'm also an author. I've written a number of books. And one of the books is called Last in the City, which uh, I'll be making available for free for all of you. I will send it to your pastor via WhatsApp and he'll distribute it to you through that channel. If you can't get it via WhatsApp, I'll give you a link where you can download it. So I'm really looking forward to hearing from you and to answering whatever questions the Lord puts in your heart. Over to you back, Pastor Kihu. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Ernest. Uh, what an amazing thing that uh, you're actually making your book available. And I know that um, it's uh, going to be a blessing to many. Um, I'm, I'm sure that uh, those that have not been able to see that book and to read it uh, will definitely be blessed in a big way. Thank you so very much uh, for that great offer. And uh, in the way of introduction um, of, of this session, of course, without uh, repeating uh, what we've been through in the last few minutes, um, maybe it might be good for you to just in this live audience, probably some that are here right now are not even present uh, during the, the premier session. I know they can go back to that later on. But in this live audience, um, just assume we are across the table with you and this young man or this lady who is single or even married has come to you and have said, but honest, do these things really work? Is sexual purity a reality or is it a myth? Yes. Um, thank you, Pastor Key, for that. And thank you for all the comments I'm seeing online from uh, TechnoSparks, Betty, Maina, Michael. Thank you so much. Um, yes, it is a reality. It is a reality. It's possible to live a sexually pure life. Now, the reason it may feel like a myth, Pastor Key, who is because we live in a sexually saturated world. We live in a world where sexual imagery is all around us. And I don't know how many of you agree 
you go online and it's there on facebook it's there on instagram you can't avoid sex you go on tv it's it's there in the adverts you go on music videos you drive down the road it's it's everywhere sexual imagery is all around us and we live in a world that is constantly bombarding us with sexual imagery and because of that it's very possible to feel like i maze hi dunia misi tamik it it's too much and again we live in a world that does not espouse the biblical values when you talk about waiting for sex until marriage <laughs> even attends the church people will look at you and go like ah man let's be practical let's be practical to say to kweli bana you know and god is giving us his grace and his grace is a very practical grace and i hope that all of us will grab that practical grace today because um if you decide to trust the lord and engage in his grace you will live a pure life when mm-hmm. i was dating my wife uh we made a vow to one another we said we will wait for sex until marriage and guys god's grace enabled us to wait until marriage we did wait mm-hmm. until marriage it's mm-hmm. very possible and so for anyone out there who may be feeling like the grace is not available let me tell you just reach out for it grab it you will be shocked at how christ can sustain us because the bible mm. says in second corinthians chapter 1 verse 21 that it is god who makes us stand firm in christ jesus yeah amen amen god's grace is sufficient and i see a, a very strong comment there by beatrice ongari who saying i grab the grace amen make it without the grace of god um not even joseph of the bible who was able to flee from Uh, sexual immorality and i'm glad that we have countless uh, scripture quotations that are very very positive now um maybe now that the area of uh, sexual purity is an area that um you you are known for um in terms of speaking in various forums um out there in the media and of course written about this how bad is the situation um and i know you can give this in terms of statistics from two perspectives on one perspective is well the situation might be as bad as it may look but on the other hand we still have a remnant so maybe a minute or two you can mention about what are the statistics looking like and are there remnants out there all right yes so i'll tell you this guys first of all um The Bible tells us that as we approach the end times things are going to get worse. Uh the church is going to get brighter and brighter and the world is going to get darker and darker. So that means the disparity between good and evil will only contrast more and more. What does that mean for us right now? Right now we live in a world where uh the three things that I had mentioned about I had mentioned in the video that you guys watched on YouTube heterosexuality monogamy and matrimony so one let's start with heterosexuality we live in a world that is normalizing the opposite homosexuality that is normalizing attraction between men and men women and women and saying you know what this could even be proposed in a marriage and marriage situation countries like the united states have legalized uh, same sex unions and this has also pushed over to many other countries in the west like uh, france uh, like like ireland and 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 it's becoming a very normative thing in the west let's talk about monogamy the rate of many people the, the rate of people who are ex, who are experimenting with sexual activity outside the conference of marriage I mean the the stats are clear right here even in Kenya the, the the crisis that was highlighted by NTV of teenage pregnancies that were really really skyrocketing and those are just the ones who got pregnant imagine the number who did not get pregnant out of those sexual encounters and then matrimony um you find that marriages are breaking adultery is on the increase and i'll tell you this pastor kihu i spend a lot of time talking to young people and even ministering to couples and most of the issues that bring many people my way is just sexual brokenness people who are at a point where they look at their sexuality and it's enslaved them or maybe it has what they are thinking where they stand for what god is standing against and they say i think this is right so we live in a world that rejects what god says We live in a world where if you stand up and say you know what guys 
honor your girlfriend, honor your boyfriend, wait until the marriage institution. They may tell you, sasa difference yake na bro yangu itakuwa nini? Sasa difference yake na sister yake, sister yangu itakuwa nini? You know? And you start thinking, then what's the point? What's the point of living this pure life? So we must understand this the kind of world we live in. Um, on the other extreme end is crime. Uh, mm-hmm. I'll tell you this, there's a woman who came for, for counseling uh recently and she was hor- i mean she was just crying through the session as my wife and I were ministering to her because she has a one year old baby actually mm-hmm. the baby was 11 months and mm-hmm. would you believe it she has an older brother who is 37 years old and one time when she was cleaning her baby changing the diaper she notices that her baby's private parts the baby's a girl are very swollen and the baby's in constant pain has been crying the whole day and the private parts are looking very very disfigured and she kept wondering what's wrong. And so now one of the little boys in the neighborhood came and just told her the truth. And she found out that her 37 year old brother had actually raped her 11 year old daughter. She broke down. Imagine a 37 year old man inserting his organs in a 11 month old girl. And it was a really, really, really ugly situation. So we've got the cute side of things but we also have the really ugly side of things sexual sin is really really breaking our world yeah yes uh, but i'm glad that there is hope indeed and that's yes. the reason this forum i pray that this would spark a fire we are 38 of us right now many more will watch this later on i pray that one of us can light up the fire uh, light a candle and you know, be an example that is worth to be emulated and, of course, encourage somebody else and the journey can go on. Kindly uh, to everyone that is online with us, we are definitely going to be taking your questions. If you can drop them at the chats, uh, there is a team, that, as I said earlier, that is ready to analyze those questions. Uh, the, the purpose of analyzing is not to ask which one to ask and not which, uh, which not to ask, but so that we avoid repetition. Uh, so kindly, if you can begin uh, typing in your questions and as they come, we will be definitely allowing our guest uh, tonight to address them. And as we wait for that, um, let me take you to something. One of the three things that you said, uh, the confines of what sexual purity is, of course, heterosexual relationship, um, you know, between one man, male, and one woman, female, and of course, in the confines or within the boundaries of marriage. Um, is it that God wants to deny us pleasure? Why does he make, why, why create sexual organs and take away the fun? Ah, that, that's a good question, uh, Kihu. I like to think of our sexual energy like a fire. A f- fire is a good thing, and fire can be used for multiple things. Fire can be used uh, uh, to warm a house, for example, in a fireplace. If you get to those houses uh, that have fireplaces, they have got places where you put in wood, and then you put a little uh, fl- a little flame on the bottom of the wood, and then what happens, the, the smoke goes up a chimney, and very soon the fire warms the house all right now there's normally a boundary that is placed around the fireplace there's a little lining of bricks and normally when you put when you put the wood for the fire you ensure the wood goes within that lining of bricks when that wood goes past the lining of bricks past the boundary what will happen the fire will travel from the fireplace past the wood and if it goes past that boundary, it may touch the carpet and the fire will keep traveling. It won't stop. It will travel, go, touch the seats, touch the seats, go on, travel, perhaps touch the curtains and eventually even burn the whole house. When the fire is within the fireplace, it warms the house. When the fire is outside the fireplace, it burns down the house. That's the same thing with our sexuality. Our sexuality is a beautiful fire. And God wants us to warm the house. God wants us to enjoy the fire. God wants us to have the fire warm the house and do, so that the fire can serve us. But the moment we take the fire outside the fireplace, the fire stops serving us. The fire starts hunting us. 
the fire starts being a master over us instead of it being a servant over us. So God wants us to have our sexual energy in a way that we can enjoy it and in a way that we are the master of it. But the moment it masters us, we are no longer in control. So God is not anti-sex. God is for sex. In fact, the Bible begins with two naked people in a garden. Huh? That is as sexy as it gets. And the Bible begins with them being commanded, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. How are they going to do that? Through cell division? I think not. It is through the beautiful act of sex. God does not want to limit your sexual pleasure. God wants you to enjoy your sexual pleasure, but he wants you to enjoy it in such a way that he does not destroy you. Mm. Lastly, I'll just give this example. Think of a fish in the water. When a fish is in the water, it's free. Isn't it free? It yeah. truly is free. Now, what if you say, no, this fish is not free. This fish is limited to the water. I am going to give this fish freedom. I am going to remove it from the water and I'm going to throw it up in the air and have it land there in the, put it or put it out there in the trees in a, in a forest. And they tell the fish, you are now free. You can explore the whole world. Is that fish truly free? Absolutely not. It is not free. If anything, it is in bondage. That's the same thing. You are only free when you are within the place where you are where, where you are built to operate. A fish is truly free within the water. Mm. A bird is truly free in the air. Similarly, our sexuality is only truly free within heterosexuality, monogamy, and matrimony. That wow. is God's wow. plan for us. Awesome, awesome. Well said. Uh, the Lord is not putting the boundaries because of hating us, but indeed, actually, He is protecting us. He's protecting us so that the fire can warm the house, but not bring it down. I love that. And of course, there are countless um, examples of fires that have ended up uh, burning down marriages and families and a lot of devastation in the world. Um, so uh, this is very well said. Uh, in a moment, I will be uh, looking through the questions. They are coming fast and furious. Okay, furious in a good way. Uh, but just before then, uh, uh, Ernest, allow me to uh, have you turn a little bit to something that has uh, you've, you've already mentioned. Uh, let me ask it as a direct question so that uh, probably just forms the basis of your answer. Is anybody born gay? All right. That's a very good question that keeps coming uh, whenever I've talked, about, whenever I'm invited to speak on sessions on LGBTQ matters, that question is always asked, is anyone born gay? And I'll tell you this, the answer is no. The leading scientist on homosexual studies is a man by the name of Simon LaVey. He's a doctor and he's also an atheist. Dr. Simon LaVey has conducted by far the most research on same-sex attraction, and in all his research, he came through several conclusions by looking at the lives of several people who are, uh, who are heterosexual and people who are homosexual. And he noticed one thing, that in the study of genetics, there's no such thing as a gay gene. There's nothing in our DNA that predisposes us to homosexual behavior. Now, if there was such a thing as a gay gene, what would happen is that twins who are born uh, from one particular mother would have the same sexual orientation. And in all his research, in fact, in one time it was replicated about 36 times because that's what happens with scientific research. It's not just verified. It must be verified by other scientists for it to be confirmed. Some of his research on homosexual studies were replicated 36 times. And in all the 36 replications, it was found over and over that what he had found initially was true, that there's nothing in us naturally that predisposes us to homosexuality. Homosexuality and lesbianism are a nature issue and not a nature issue. And mm. so we must ask ourselves, what is the root cause of this thing that causes us to get to a situation where people are predisposed to same-sex attraction? I'll tell you a few things that push people in that direction. Number one, sodomy. Sodomy is a leading cause for same-sex attraction, especially amongst men. Men who have suffered sodomy, especially from older men, end up getting older and tending to experiment with same-sex attraction. 
Another reason could be deficiency in parental relationships. Fathers play a big role in the formation of the identity of children. And when fathers don't play that role, they can cause a serious emotional deficiency in children and they can look for satisfaction of that deficiency in same-sex relationships. All right. And finally, it's just a sinful heart. Our hearts are naturally predisposed to sin. So I'll tell you this. If you do not give your, if you do not, uh, if you do, if you let your 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 own emotions and your let and your own physical desires run free, you will be very very shocked at some of the things that you desire, despite you being a born again Christian. If a naked woman walks in front of you, Pastor Kihu, mm -hmm. and you look at her, you will you will be you will be shocked that you are a pastor, you are born again, you are married, and yet you find yourself desiring an extra marital affair with someone who's not your wife. Now, what do you do with that desire as a born-again Christian? Do you submit to it and say, I have always felt like this? No. You kill the flesh. You submit to God and you do what we do with every other kind of desire in us. We quell it. We turn away from it until God sanctifies us. So no, no one is born gay. No one is born as a lesbian. No one is born as a, uh, we even have what you call uh, the trans, what, what do you call them? Uh, the, the trans people, you know, uh, the people say, you know, they're, they're transsexual. No one is born with that kind of orientation. Science refutes it. And whatever science is proving, the Lord had already spoken about way, way in advance. Yeah. All right, great. Uh, okay, let's uh, take a few questions uh, from you. Um, um, let me begin with one that asks, uh, as a church, what can we do to sensitize immoral sexual behavior since most of these topics are repressed or is a taboo in our African setting? The answer is to just speak. Because Jesus spoke about them, we ought to speak about them. And so the gospel must be spoken and Jesus Christ did not hold back the truth from us. So whenever culture contradicts the scriptures, we go with the scriptures. And so our cultures may be shy to talk about homosexuality. Our cultures may be shy to talk about pornography, to talk about contraceptives. But you realize that silence does not make the problem go away. It mm -hmm. only ignores it, and the problem still remains even when you come later to address it. And many a times, by the time you come later to address it, it has evolved. And so we don't want the church to be silent on these matters. We don't want Maina and Kingangi to be the voices on yeah. sexual matters in this country. We as the church must speak, and we must not be silenced regardless of what anyone says to us. That's what we must do. We must speak. And speaking, we are. That is the reason we are on a live social media platform. And uh, making sure that this information is not only available for us who are here, but even those who will be able to receive it hereafter. So we have started, and I think it is a responsibility of each one of us that is in this platform to take your time and begin wherever you are. In fact, there's someone who is saying, what would she do to a person that is in the prison worship? I presume uh, she's part of that prison worship team. But this man says that he must do everything that other youths of the world are doing. Uh, maybe the first question before you respond to this, Omboe, that is coming to my mind, is whether this man is actually a Christian at all. How can he be a Christian and he wants to be like the world? And that's the, in fact, that's the real question. Thank you for mentioning it. Friends, please understand this, that the Lord is calling us to live a pure life. And the Bible says in the book of 2 Timothy that the Lord knows those who are his. That is 2 Timothy chapter 2. The Lord knows those who are his. What does that mean? That when you genuinely come to Christ, there's something that will happen to you. One, he will give you his Holy Spirit. And his Holy Spirit will give you a new desire to live a righteous life. Now, the proof of the Holy Spirit living inside of you is the fruit. 
You will desire to honor God. You will desire to honor him. You will desire to live a pure life. You will desire to have the fruit of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Those fruits will be present in your life. And you desire to do them to please the Lord who died for you. Now, if you find yourself in a situation where you call yourself a Christian, but yet you have no desire to please the Lord, in fact, you hate the stand of the Christian faith and you desire to only do that which is pleasing to the flesh and that which the world likes. Guys, the Bible says, watch yourselves and examine yourselves to see if you're truly in the faith. The Bible says in 2 Timothy, 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5, examine yourself to see if you're in the faith. And this is what Jesus did. Jesus warned us in the book of Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 to 23. He said, this is what will happen on that final day of judgment. He said, many people will come to me and say, Lord, 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 did we not do these things in your name? And then they start mentioning things of ministry. Lord, did we not serve in the worship team? Did we not prophesy? Did we not do this? And then what does the Bible say in Matthew chapter 7? Jesus says to them, Surely I will say to them, Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. Now listen mm -hmm. to what Jesus is saying. He's not saying, I knew you, and then you left me. He's saying, I never knew you. You were involved in church ministry, but I never knew you. He's not saying... you. Guys, he said, you're not even an ex. This relationship never started in the first place. I never knew you. It is very possible to serve in church and not be a born-again Christian. Mm -hmm. Going to church does not mean you're a Christian. Serving in the worship team does not mean you're a Christian. Just like standing in a garage does not mean you're a vehicle. Mm -hmm. Guys, your service in the church can fool you. And let me tell you, you can even sing and see people touched by the Spirit of God. And you can think, surely God has used me. I am born again. You are not. That person should not be worried about sexual purity. They've got a bigger problem to worry about. They've got a heaven and a hell matter to worry about. You are asking the wrong questions. You should be asking, what can I do to be saved? Yeah. Because truly born again believers desire to follow the Lord and desire to honor him. Do they struggle? Yes, they struggle. Do they fall? Yes, they fall. But they get up and they want to please the Lord, even with their sexuality. Wonderful. I think that is a very much well said. And I think that also brings about the question of um, how well our young, our young people, and not just young people, Christians at large, we are growing in the faith and getting discipled because of course, a lot of these things have to do with how well are we discipled, how well are we into the word, so that when we are going against the will of God, there is that inner voice of the Holy Spirit that keeps bringing us back. All right, somebody is asking, uh, during the premiere session, you stated that kissing uh, an, uh, someone who is not your wife or husband is a sin. What about hugging? All right. Now, that's a good question. Now, let me explain that point in case anyone joined us. Now, let me tell you something about your sexuality. Your sexuality is very interesting. It, your sexuality adheres to something that I call the law of progression. You know what the law of progression is? When you give it something to taste, it wants more of it. And it wants more than the previous time. That's the thing with our sexuality. Today, if you give it a kiss, tomorrow it wants a longer kiss. The next day, it wants a longer, deeper kiss. The next day, it wants more than that. It wants the clothes off. The next day, our sexuality is operates with the law of progression. The more you indulge in it, the more it wants, more and more and more. All right? And so this is the thing that the Bible says in Songs of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 7, chapter 3, verse 5, and chapter 8, verse 4. Do not awaken love until it is ready. If you start to awaken it, it will run out of control. And so that's the thing with people who say, kissing my boyfriend, kissing my girlfriend. The moment you start kissing your boyfriend today, tomorrow you will want more than a kiss. The next mm -hmm. day more than a kiss. And you may say, oh, honest, I'm in control. That's what everyone thinks until you find one day you are no longer in control. The Bible mm -hmm. says in 1 Corinthians 10, 12, if you think you're standing, take heed lest you fall. So please understand that your sexuality adheres to the law of progression. It gets it gets hungrier and hungrier, hotter and hotter with time. So what's the way? Reserve all that energy for the marriage bed. 
Now, what about hugging? What about hugging? Now, if I tell you this is the line, do not hug, do not what, this is what will happen. You'll become legalistic. The point is this, that hug that you're giving, is it a hug that is going in accordance with the law of progression? Is it a hug that is sinful or is it a righteous hug? Because I'll tell you, Pastor Kiho, I remember even when I was in church, and at times you are from the worship team, you've ministered, or you're from, you're an usher, or you've seen the, you know, church is over, and you're meeting out there in the parking lot, and then this girl comes and says, Ernest, I've missed you, and she comes and gives me a very long hug, a very, very long, tight hug, and she's held me like this, and then she lets me go. And that time, I have felt her entire breastplate of righteousness on me. Buona <laughs> sifiwe. You can tell this woman has the full armor of God. Amen. Yeah? Do you know what happens when you feel the breasts of a woman on your chest? Mm -hmm. What happens? You start to feel that sexual excitement. And the next time, you want more than a hug. You want that hug to linger, to stay long. And I remember those hugs used to lead me into wanting more and wanting more and wanting more and then now you want a kiss now you want that so what i did is that i had to be very clear i had to shake the hands of some of my friends who are women and for those who i had to hug i had to hug them in a very honorable way where mm -hmm. i hug them and i don't feel their chest i don't feel their breast now there's a bible verse for that the Bible says in the book of Proverbs chapter 5, verse 14 thereabout, it says, drink water from your own well, running water from your own system. Should your streams overflow in the streets, your streams of water in the public squares, it says, do not embrace the bosom of another man's wife. Mm -hmm. Do you know what the bosom is? The bosom is this area. I hope you can see me very clear. This is the bosom. Let me tell you, this, you may not know it, but this is a very sexual area. Mm. Gentlemen, if a woman just passed her hand like this on you, utawaka moto. Sini ukweli, majama muniambio kweli. Mwanam ketua ki fonyetu. Oh, just look at my hand. Mwanam ketua fonyetu hivi. Mara moja tu. You can light KCC with fireworks with that one touch. The entire KCC can be lit. Mkono tu moja ipide tu hivi. Now, let me tell you, for women, it's worse. They've got breasts. Breasts are very sexual organs. Breasts have, are sensitive. When you touch a woman's breasts, she'll get sexually excited. Okay? So, what am I saying? Guys, honor one another. Please mm -hmm. don't give one another those breastplate of righteousness hugs. Musipatiane, don't do that. And then just to go back to what I talked about in the video. Remember we talked about defrauding one another? And let me just use my glass here. I've got a nice glass of water here so that I can demonstrate. I explained it in the video, but maybe with a the, with the glass it will make sense. Imagine if one of us is very thirsty and they see me with this cup of water. Huh? And they see me with this cup of water. And, and this cup of water has got, it looks very nice and cool. And you're really thirsty. And you come to me and say, oh, Ernest, I'm really thirsty. And they tell you, okay, you can have us. You, you can drink my water. Then you come and you drink the water. Then I pull it away. You have just barely touched a sip. Then I pull it away. Have mm -hmm. I made your thirst easier or worse? I have made it worse. Mm -hmm. That is what happens with the law of progression. The moment you give someone a sip, you have made their sexuality worse. It is better that they didn't taste that sip in the first place. So uh, if you're going to hug, let your hugs be righteous. Let your hugs be pure. And one of the ways I do that at times with my, with my friend, I just give them a side hug. If it's a front hug, there is room for the Holy Spirit between, between us. Amen. Yes. Amen. Wonderful. Wonderful. Um, yes. Uh, questions still coming. Let's see how, how much more we can take in the next couple of minutes. Um, now, there's a question that I've seen a couple of times, and I had it actually on um, my notes earlier on, the question of restoration. Of course, some of the people that may be listening right now might have uh, already fallen into the trap of sexual sin, or have been struggling, and or we are still in this life, and uh, may find themselves in a mess. Please talk about restoration for a moment. All right. And I think I'll just talk a bit about my story. 
So, Pastor Kihu, I struggled with pornography when I was in campus. I struggled with pornography and masturbation, both of them. And it was very embarrassing. Very, very embarrassing because my mom is an Anglican reverend. So, maybe I'm a pastor. I'm a PK. All right. Um, not only am I struggling as the pastor's kid, um, the enemy is telling me I am the only one. And this is the thing that when you're struggling with sexual sin as a born again believer, the enemy always tells you, you are the only one. And so because of that, it's very hard to get out. So there is a, the, the reality of the difficulty of it. Okay. Uh, perhaps you're a Christian and you're struggling with same sex attraction and you're wondering, how can I be a believer and yet be attracted to people of the same sex, you know, or you are born again and yet you find yourself constantly falling into masturbation, whatever it is, you can struggle, all right? And how do you get out? What is restoration? Guys, the first step is confess. If you want to be free, you must bring light into the darkness. Sexual sin thrives in anonymity and secrecy, places where you're not known let me tell you, if you want to know sexual sin is sexual sin, if you think what you and your boyfriend are doing is okay, one day before service, in front of everyone, before the service begins, Kabla present worship, stand in front of the church and what you and your boyfriend do in the hostel, do it there. See if the church will celebrate and say praise God. If they will not, then what you're doing is sin. Why? Because sin operates in darkness. Excuse me. So what did I do? I had to confess. The Bible says in James 5, 16, confess your sins one to another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. Restoration begins with confession, Pastor Kihu. So I remember I went to my Bible study and I said, I'm going to confess. I'm tired of this pornography. I'm tired of this masturbation. And guys, let me tell you, confession is hard amongst Christians. Hey, because I went and I'm hearing testimonies by fellow believers. Someone is saying, praise God, my brothers, I woke up at three in the morning and I was seeing dreams and visions and I was speaking in tongues and the Lord revealed to me these great mysteries and I'm thinking, wah, 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 wah. The other guy is saying, praise God, you know, I've just been studying the book of Zephaniah and I've been getting, and I'm thinking, after Zephaniah, Nisha is Omar. And I'm looking around and everyone looks spiritual. And let me tell you, I was feeling like I am the worst sinner on earth. But let me tell you, I said, I don't care. I must confess because light is needed. So I said, guys, please pray for me. I am struggling with prayer. Prayer. Maombi. I'm struggling with prayer. And uh, yes, Miss <laughs> Idiani. And they asked me, Ernest, are you sure? I said, okay, guys. Please pray for me. I'm starting with pornography. And guys were silent. One of my friends put his hand on me and said, Brother Ernest, me too. Wow. Let me tell you, Pastor Kihu, that was the best day of my life. <laughs> because when he said me too, I said, Eh, ata wewe, nilijua wewe, wewe unaka, wewe, nilijua si ikitu si kopeke yangu. And then the other guy said, Eh, wase, eh, me too. I'm like, Atawe was Zephaniah. Ay, 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 Kumbe ikitu tuko wengi. Guys, when you confess, you not only set yourself free, there are many others who need that freedom. Mm -hmm. So confession is the first step. You must expose the sin. You may be surprised 50% of the work will be done. After you confess, you repent. My friends used to meet each other every Tuesday and would ask each other, are you living in purity? Your girlfriend, are you walking in purity? Are you honoring one another? We had to do that. We kept you accountable. You must belong to community if you want to be restored. There is no restoration outside community. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. And then, of course, what I had said, you avoid the source of sin, check your company. But there are two more that I'll just add. They, they, they don't talk about the last two uh, just before I, I, I hand over to you again, Pastor Q. The knowledge of the word of God. Let me tell you, uh, guys, if you are not taking in the word of God as a believer, if you are not imbibing the word of God, you are starving your spirit man. You guys feed your physical body at least three meals a day. How many meals do you feed your spirit man? If some of you looked at your spirit man, if you had the opportunity to see a vision of your spirit man, you'd be surprised that your spirit man look like those kids who have kwashiako and are about to die. Why? Because they are hungry. You only feed them once a week. How can you expect to win a spiritual battle when you don't feed that guy? 
You must feed them. You must feed them. You must feed on the word of God. Read it. Hear it. Study it. Remember, personally, not depending on Pastor Kihu personally. And finally, Pastor Kihu, um, what happened is that in June 2011, I got free from the clutches of pornography and masturbation. But I discovered something, Pastor Kihu. Um, when I was fooling around with pornography and masturbation, I attracted demonic attacks in my life. There are days I'd go to sleep, Pastor Kihu, and I would feel something choking me, choking me at night. And I'm trying to pray and I can't pray. I'm trying to wake up, I can't wake up, and my body is paralyzed. And there are days I'd go to sleep and I would dream of myself having sex with people. There are days I wake up and at times I even find myself, I've, it's like I've had sex. And I remember I was bound and every time that thing would come and it would sit on my chest and it would choke me. And I remember one day, I remember Joel 2.32, it shall come to pass, they that call upon the name of the Lord shall be delivered. So I remember that day I just said, Jesus, and I remember that thing disappeared. Now this is a funny thing and this is how I knew it was a real thing. Because I started researching on it and someone was telling me, oh, it is just called sleep paralysis, it's a medical condition. But I talked to a man of God and told me, honest that's not sleep paralysis, that is demonic oppression. Now, this is the thing. If you are born again, you cannot be possessed by a demon, but you can be oppressed. Did you get that? Born again believers are filled with the, the Holy Spirit lives inside of you. So you may not be possessed, but an unclean spirit can oppress you. So what happened the next day? It came, it was choking me, and Pastor Q, it covered my mouth. And I, re and I realized that sexual sin not only... Uh, drags you down into indiscipline but it also opens you up to demonic activity mm -hmm. so i remember in june 2011 after i confessed my sin i repented i cut off my entertainment i had lots of entertainment that had nudity this these movies that had men and women in bed i deleted all of them i said i want nothing to do with them and then i changed my company those breastplate of righteousness hugs nilianza could shake me corner i did away with them and then i began to really take the word of god seriously and one day in June 2011, I remember I was pray I, I had gone to see a friend of mine, and I felt that same thing attack me. And this time, it was during the day, and I felt this thing hold me on the back. And I remember I prayed, Joel 2.32, I called upon the name of the Lord. I felt something come up my body and leave up my head, it's like as if it was sucked with a vacuum. And I remember that was the last day I struggled with pornography and masturbation. It disappeared instantly. So I realized that when it comes to sexual sin, your problem could be in three ways. I call them the three Ds. It could be discipline, discipleship, or deliverance. One of those three Ds. If it is not discipline, it is discipleship. If it is not discipleship, it is deliverance. Find out where you are lacking. Guys, if it is deliverance, go before the Lord and pray for him because the Bible said he is able to break the chains of darkness. And you can even have your pastor pray for you if you suspect that you are under spiritual attack. If it is discipleship, please understand that you need people around you in order to walk the talk and walk purely. And if it is discipline, guys, please understand that God will not do by miracle what you ought to do by obedience. Some of you are praying for a miracle, for God to remove your sexual sinful desires. And yet God is telling you, be disciplined. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Restoration is possible, but we need to obey and we need to put in the work. Yeah. Wow. Amen. Amen. This is a wonderful, a wonderful time. And um, I, we are bringing this to a close in the next couple of minutes. I'll be asking our brother Ernest to pray. Um, and as he prepares to do that, uh, maybe... Uh, let me just confirm that we are not leaving out any questions, but there are wonderful comments, uh, the feedback on what uh, Ernest has been saying tonight, that we need to avoid secrecy, we need to avoid uh, doing things that uh, where uh, we, we are all by ourselves, you know, uh, and anything that we cannot, we are not willing to be exposed. I remember when I was quoting Paris as we prepared to get married, one of the things that we agreed is that any of our discussions during our coaching, we would be willing to have it tape recorded and taken to our pastor, and we would not be embarrassed if it was to be played. And wow. if we have any reason to be embarrassed, then that can wait. That should wait until we get married. And we kept reminding each other that we want to take each other to heaven. And I, and I believe that uh, each one of us need people around us also 
people that we can be free with, that we can open up to, and just like Ernest is saying, sometimes we may be opening up to people who are also struggling, and then we will partner with each other, and we will hold each other accountable. So it's been a great night. It's been a great night, and I do not want to prolong it too long. Uh, so uh, Brother Ernest, if you may have any parting shot, uh, and then uh, in the next few minutes, we will be bringing this to a close. Uh, you praying for us, praying for redemption. And, and probably as you bring this to a close, uh, you mentioned something about a situation of, of rape and a sad story there. Uh, but, but a lot of this also happens to, to Christians where they find themselves trapped in uh, there's a guilt of the devastating effects of rape in someone's life. Um, how, how does someone recover in terms of, um, okay, probably, yeah, sometimes they are blaming themselves. They're saying probably I exposed myself or they're feeling bad within because their virginity was broken. And even if this was not their wish, um, what advice, what quick advice would you give to somebody that has been through it? All right. Um, uh, first of all, I really sympathize with anyone out there who's been uh, defiled. Um, even both, even men, there are men who are defiled at times by house helps, at times by fellow men. Um, and, the, and most rape victims are women, you know, um, and, and not even just and not even just the traditional kind of rape. There are women even who are uh, every day in our matatus, you know, uh, you find women who are sexually harassed by men who brush their hands against their private parts, against their bodies. And I, I, I talk to my wife, I talk to my sisters, and at times I just get angry when I hear my wife has come through town and she tells me the things that have happened to her. It's, it's really heartbreaking. And so, uh, first of all, let me encourage you that there are men that God has put in this world who are meant to be your defenders. Mm -hmm. And I know there are men out there who have killed the image of what masculinity is. But let me encourage you that there is a remnant. And that remnant is out there to protect you, not to take advantage of you. When mm -hmm. I was dating my wife, I told her, your purity is my priority. And I said, I need to protect my wife, not just from other people, but also from myself. And there are many men like that. There's always a remnant out there. What will I say to you? First of all, understand that you are clean in the eyes of the Father. And the Father is the creator of heaven and earth. And he's by far the highest authority that ever was, that ever is, and that ever will be. And he says you are clean. He says you are pure. And the, the, the forceful the forceful defilement of someone does not take away your cleanliness. The blood of Jesus Christ covers all your sin, and the blood of Jesus Christ covers all faults done against you. There are people who sin against you. So it's not your, it's not your fault that you are defiled. It's not your fault that someone took advantage of you. And please understand that in Christ Jesus, you are clean. You are clean. You are accepted. You are not defined by that defilement. And that defilement is not your fault. That defilement does not mean that you fall short of God's glory. You are clean. And this is also true for anyone who feels like they're falling short of God's glory. God says, I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. Rape is no one's choice. No one wakes up and chooses to be raped. No one wakes up and chooses to be defiled. And so please understand that positionally in the eyes of God, you are accepted and you are clean. So let that be your identity first of all. That the Father accepts you, and because you're accepted, the body of Christ, and I speak on behalf of the church, we accept you. We don't push you aside. You are not a second-rate woman. You're not a second-rate man. You're not a second-rate... You are not less of marriage material because someone took advantage of you. No. You are clean in the eyes of God, and you are clean in the eyes of the church, and you are accepted. And anyone who thinks otherwise is unfortunate because they only see through the lens of the enemy, and they only see through the lens of this fallen world. All right? Secondly, I would say get professional help. And professional help means come to the church, there's counseling. Come get help. Because healing must occur, inner healing must occur. You must get to a place where 
you can let go of the pain that is holding you because those who sin against you do not carry the weight that they have put on you. That weight is in your heart and that weight needs to be released. Some of that weight is in the form of bitterness. And you'll be surprised that the way to get rid of bitterness, anger, frustration, resentment is to forgive your offenders and let God be your defender. And this is what God says, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. And let me tell you, when the Lord decides to avenge his children, he takes his vengeance personally. And I have seen God avenge people to the point that even the ones who are hurt can even, even tell God, okay, Imetosha, they've learned their lesson. God wants to avenge you. And trust yourself to God and let him avenge you. Don't take vengeance in your hands because God wants to do it for you and God wants to do it righteously. When you take vengeance into your hands, you also put yourself in the path of God's wrath. Move out of the way, let God fight for you. And that means getting the necessary help that will lead you to forgiving these people and blessing them. That weight will fall off. That weight will fall off completely. All right? And then finally, I would just say, always belong in community. Healing occurs in community. Don't push yourself away from people. Stay where people are because in community, especially the ecclesia, the body of Christ, that will get your healing. And then finally, just a word of a, a parting shot for all of us. Guys, honor one another as brothers and sisters in the Lord. Observe the right boundaries. I'll tell you, I have enjoyed the company of women when I have honored boundaries with them. I am able to laugh with them, enjoy them, have great relationships with them, even as a married man with fellow women. Why? Because we observe the right boundaries and there is no fear. The moment I don't observe the boundaries, I start to not enjoy those relationships. As the same thing with my wife and with many other people out there, they'll tell you, you are able to enjoy your relationships with fellow men when you observe the right kind of boundaries. All right? If there are conversations, like Pastor Kihu said, that if you knew you cannot have this conversation in the presence of someone else, don't have that conversation. If there are things you're sending each other on WhatsApp in the middle of the night that you would not send to your own pastor or you would not have anyone see in public, do not send each other. Enjoy your relationships by observing the right kind of boundaries. When you get married, you will be so glad. You will be so glad because God did not make men and women to be enemies of each other. He made us to complement one another. And oh, what a beauty it is when we go back to how Adam and Eve related in the Garden of Eden, or as is exemplified today in the relationship of Christ and the church. It's possible. It's doable. Pursue purity with all their heart, with all your heart. And just finally, I want the gentlemen, gentlemen, I speak this as a man. Listen, gentlemen, you need to realize that if you fail the battle of sexual purity, you fail the family. Why am I not speaking to the women? Because the plan of the enemy is to emasculate the man, discourage the woman, and destroy the family. When the man is destroyed, the woman is discouraged. That is why it is called the sin of Adam. Please understand that David was the most musical, the most spiritual man, but he fell because of sexual sin. Samson was the strongest man, but he fell because of sexual sin. Solomon was the wisest man, but he fell because of sexual sin. Your sexual sin can cut down your destiny, but you also need to remember that Joseph was a man who stood. If Joseph had slept with Potiphar's wife, he would never have gotten to the palace. He would have suffered intense delay and intense frustration. Please get out of bed with Potiphar's wife and run to the palace. There are nations and destinies waiting for you and there are families that are depending on you men to stand firm so that this nation of Kenya can stand. If the men fall, guys, it doesn't matter how committed the women are, they will have no husbands to marry and they will have no leaders in the home because the men are the leaders of the family. So men, stand up, lead these women, Show them that the family has hope and they will follow the example of Christ and the church through your sanctification. Amen. Amen. And indeed, what a night this has been. And I do, uh, truly want to thank God for you, our brother Ernest Omboye. Um, we're grateful to God, uh, even for everyone that has been able to 
either zoom in or uh, participate in the previous session a little earlier tonight. Thank you so very much. And we look forward to a lot more of these sessions. Uh, just to let you know that every month we would want to address a topic that concerns the young people in our generation. So pray with us and we can look forward to the next uh, session in the month of August. And definitely as the Lord would allow us, I know we can also have our brother Ernest with us back on this subject, maybe a little later, but uh, he has promised a few things. I know he will be sharing with me the link to his book, The Last and the City, if I'm not wrong, that's the title of the book. And as soon as I get that, uh, we will share the, the link with you so that you're able to get that uh, uh, form, or rather the link so that you can uh, get to read the book. And any one of you who would want to find uh, or to, to connect with Ernest outside of this platform, uh, if you would want to uh, pay him a visit and get to know what he does for those who are getting ready to get married, he has wonderful programs that he runs. Uh, definitely, uh, you can uh, just get through uh, to me or uh, through the same platform that you are able to know about this meeting. I am very much willing to give you contacts to our brother Ernest. Uh, so the Lord bless you so much. Thank you for being here. I want uh, to ask Ernest, if you would pray, if you would bring this to a close in a word of prayer, uh, that God would heal, that God would strengthen, and that God would actually empower us to walk in sexual purity. Brother Ernest. Amen. Let's pray. Um, Father, in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, may you pour out your spirit on us so that, Father, we may repent and we may revert to you. Father, I ask for your mercy to be upon us. Where we have fallen short of your glory, would you remember mercy and not judgment? And would you pour your compassion on us? so that, Lord, we may experience your blessing and not your wrath. I ask, Abba Father, that you take away our sin and that the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ, would cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Father, for those who don't know you, may you convict them of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment, that they may repent and believe in the name of the Son of God, who gave their life, his life for them, and that they may be saved. I pray that, Lord Jesus, you may give us a hunger that thirsts for righteousness, a deep-seated hatred for sin, and a fear of God. I pray that, Lord Jesus, you may help us desire purity. I pray that, Lord Jesus, you may kill everything in us that does not conform to the pattern of God than, and, and that conforms rather to the pattern of this world. I pray that, Lord Jesus, you may raise our men to be passionate to lead these women, and that you may raise our women to be passionate to follow Christ with reckless abandon, trusting him with all their hearts. Lord, I pray may amos the full armor of God. Let truth be our guard, our guard, our guard, the guard for our loins. Let truth hold us together. Sanctify us with your word. Your word is truth. Father, may we reject the lies of this world, the lies concerning sexuality in this world. The world is peddling so many lies concerning sex. We reject them all. Hollywood is peddling so many lies about sex. We reject them all and we put on the belt of truth. I must with the breastplate of righteousness, the true breastplate of righteousness, where we desire you more than anything, where we honor you and worship you for who you are, because you're beautiful, because you sacrifice yourself for us. I must with the shoes of readiness spread the gospel of peace. Help us be ambassadors of the message of the gospel, that, Father, we may fight by declaring our stand and showing others the light that is Christ. I must with the shield of faith to extinguish the flame arrows of Satan. Father, I'm praying that every work of darkness in the name of fear, worry, doubt, anxiety, pride, lust, envy, greed, gluttony, wrath, sloth, whatever it is, pornography, masturbation, homosexuality, bestiality, every kind of struggle, fornication, adultery, I pray they may all be extinguished because we walk by faith and not by sight. May your fire, according to Psalm 97, consume the enemies of God round about. Arm us with the helmet of salvation, that we may know who we are, that we may remember we are loved, we are accepted, we are appreciated, we are affirmed, that the Father in heaven loves us, the Father in heaven has good thoughts towards us. Help us remember our identity, that Father, we are not defined by our sin, we are defined by your grace. And Father, for anyone who's feeling downcast, may you remove their guilt and their shame. Would you let them know they are forgiven and that their sins are cast away as far as the east is from the west. And finally, arm us with the sword of the Spirit, which is the one 
word of God. Give us a desire to read your word, hear your word, give us a humble heart, a contrite spirit, and help us tremble at that very word that is planted inside of us that is able to save us. We pray all this, believing and trusting in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Something I always love to do as we come to the close, you are now able to unmute yourself. If you could just unmute and uh, let's make some joyful noise. Uh, in the Zoom meeting, oftentimes uh, we have to be quiet. Just try to unmute and see whether you're able to do that. I presume you should be able to unmute yourself now. I want us to make a joyful noise as we share the words of the grace. Are you able to unmute yourself? Yes. <laughs> It's been wonderful. Amen. So the Lord bless you so much. Thank you. And we will see you next month. God bless you. Bye-bye. Amen.